nostalgia. That is a formidable opponent, especially when you're trying to remake an Academy-nominated movie. The Murder on the Orient Express came to theaters November 10th, 43 years after the original classic. So, is this movie better than the original, or did nostalgia beat the remake? Also, why you can only handle so many political elements in a movie, and is there ever true justice? I'm Ben Davies, this is The Real Rebel Review. Murder on the Orient Express has grossed over $20 million currently, but it was made for over $50 million, so we'll see how it does on the box office scales. Critically, this movie did about half as well as the original classic from viewers and critics alike. But let's get into some elements of why this could be difficult for a movie to do anyway. It is interesting because of how critically acclaimed the original movie was and is always very dangerous to touch, especially the original powerhouse cast, including Ingrid Bergman, Sean Connery, and Lauren Bacall, all being stars in this movie. I mean, it is, when you go through it, it's, it's amazing the, the kind of stars that are in the original. And because this classic movie that did so well at the box office and at the Academy is based on a world-renowned book, Murder on the Orient Express, by Agatha Christie in 1934. That is a lot of steps you have to climb to try to uh, meet the standard. However, 20th Century Fox did not back down, putting together a powerhouse cast, basically an entire row of the Academy Awards in this movie. William Defoe, Judy Dench, Johnny Depp, Daisy Ridley, just to name a few. It is crazy. You're going to recognize everyone in this movie. All right, spoilers ahead. Sorry I had to do this on a mystery movie, but I can't talk about these topics without getting a little bit. Quickly, the movie is about a world-class detective who is on a train. The train gets stuck. While he's on the train, there's a murder, and there's only 12 people. They're all completely different that could have murdered this guy, and the whole movie is him just trying to figure it out. Okay. Now, okay, now so the most interesting part about this particular movie, well, really, it's two parts, but the performance by... Hercule, well, that's his character named Hercule, I can't even say his last name, uh, performed by Kenneth Brownout. Now, he has a character that is fascinating to watch. He balances comedy with intense reasoning throughout the entire film. It is, like, you can't look away when he's on screen. He's fantastic. Great character in the movie. Also, the directing of the film is phenomenal. When you're on a train, there's only so much you can do, but the way he shoots it, the way he changes the camera, shooting on 70 millimeter film is also phenomenal. The colors, the contrast, everything directorially was stunning and beautiful and interesting. And it's the same guy. Kenneth Brownell was the lead and directed the movie. I can't imagine the nights of sleep that he lost trying to prep for this, but hats off to you, man. You did a terrific job on this film. <sighs> All right, buckle up. Viewer review for The Orient Express. I'm going to give it a three out of five. Murder mysteries are always captivating to me. I mean, I love these kind of movies, and you can see this in a lot of serial dramas on TV as well. There's nothing like sitting down and being like, all right, I'm going to figure this out. Everything on screen, you pick apart, you look at each character. Do I trust them? Do I not? You saw, you see like any performances or quirks. You're like, okay, maybe that's a clue. Maybe it's not. Also, is this person just leading me astray? It's really fun just to sit back and enjoy the ride when you're trying to piece together the mystery thriller of the movie. And this movie does it. Mostly. I mean, and a lot of the movie is really fun, especially the first half. You're on this like timepiece exotic thrill ride on this train. It's like, it's old, it's interesting. All the characters do a beautiful job for the time they get on screen in the performances. Each person really has like their own kind of monologue. The only problem with this is there's so many characters trying to pack together in two hours that you get such few moments of screen time that you really only have six suspects. You only really buy that six people could have really done it because of the amount of screen time that they get. Like they're trying to like throw you off some other ones, but it's like, they're not there enough for you to really care or believe that they could have done the murder. And because of this, in the second half of the movie, it really slows down. The first half is fun and interesting, and you're starting to like, okay, who done it, who done it, who done it? But the you know, second half of the movie, you're like, well, there's only a few who done it, and so now we're just kind of watching and waiting, like, come on, come on, come on. And because it's a two-hour runtime, it really starts to lag the last 45 minutes, unfortunately. So as, as a viewer, you might get a little bit bored, but you're gonna love the first part of it. However, it is still beautiful, stunning, the score is tremendous, and it's a fun, still a fun kind of mystery thriller. Now my critic review is also gonna be a three out of five. What this movie did well, it did very well. The shots, trying to contrast it with the colors and then setting up the scenes and the mood with the different weathers that you go through on this train. It was really great the way they did that. There's a lot of symbolism, a lot of interesting camera moves to kind of give you an assessment of where there's uh, distress in the scene, who has power in the scene with the camera moves. Like I said, beautifully shot, critically well done, the music score and everything. Here's where the movie started to fail, and it really comes down to the characters they chose to focus on. And those are the two characters played by Daisy Ridley and Leslie Odom Jr. These performances are great. Daisy did a great job. Leslie did a terrific job with his role. 
And I would have loved to see their two characters in a different situation. On this train, however, when you were just trying to find murder mysteries and pick apart everything, and you try to get 12 people screen time, it's hard to have another narrative right in the middle of it. Now, obviously, the story takes place in the 1930s. Civil rights is not where it should have been. It was a terrible place for a lot of people, especially African Americans. And Leslie is an African American man who served in the military, and he and Daisy's character have a romance. Now, if you just had them on screen and said they were a couple and you know and knew about like the trials they'd be going through that's fine it's already kind of implied we know about it but they choose to really explore it and even set it up in the beginning of the movie they're one of the only two characters that get their own specific screen time when they're traveling with hercule in the beginning of the movie so you're already attached to them and kind of know their backstory you, you know they're lovers and they're trying to hide it because of social stigmas which is a really interesting story that i would love to know more about except for on this train where it's just distracting because you know neither one of these people can also be the killers it would have been really uncomfortable for either one of them to have been the killers and the bad people in this movie. And because they really want you to understand the climate and the difficulty of what this would have been like in the 1930s, most of their dialogue is just like exposition. Specifically with Leslie Odom where he has to give his entire backstory and exposition in a very dramatic scene. Like their story was the most interesting in it except you know it can't be them and that takes up about 45 minutes of the movie which is why it slows down a lot during the second half because you're like well there's not really another who done it. Now, a lot of movies fall victim to this that are trying to make points throughout it. Like being in Christian movies myself, being in, in many of them, a lot of times they do this where they force characters in to make a point, you don't believe it, and you know it's out of place and distracts from the story. And this this happens in a lot of movies. Like this is just one of those cases where I loved it, but it was kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time. So now for my faith and values review, I'm gonna give it a two out of five. In the beginning, Kenneth's master detective makes a statement where there's only black and white, good and evil, there's no gray in between. And this is something I also believe. This is the first trial given to man in the Garden of Eden. There is a spectrum of gray if you're unaware. However, in Genesis, you see Adam and Eve, even the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and because you are now aware, you know what good and evil is. Therefore, you are accountable. Now, Kenneth Brownaw's character, the master detective, makes a statement on how he believes every person is inherently good and evil are only the rare outliers. I would say biblically no, and even in a Lord of the Flies sense, just take a look at what happens when you leave people to their own devices. You try letting people live with no consequences and see what happens. Children need boundaries, adults need order to be productive, and need guidance like the perfect example of Jesus Christ, and even then we're still going to fail, which is what grace is for. Check Ephesians 5.1. Now, now, if you're not a Christian or believe in any of the biblical truths, then that's totally fine too. Let me get into some of the political elements of this that it can kind of lead to a slippery slope, which is what I'm seeing also with some of the politics going around today. Law and order is very important in any society. You need a higher standard to live by that is inarguable. It gives you the rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, because if you have that, no one can take that away. It's not an arguable thing. It is a higher thing that you are all accountable to. Unless you physically stop me from doing that, in which case you lose your rights, you go to jail. You know what I mean. All right, so spoiler alert, because I haven't given away the ending until just now, but I think this is really important to talk about. Now, Kenneth's character finds out they're all guilty and they're all broken and hurt because of what this man does. He still says, look, I cannot tell a lie, so I'm going to tell the police unless one of y'all kills me. However, the woman that orchestrated this entire elaborate plan to take down this terrible person and have the 12 people that were hurt by him all stab him and kill him, she pulls the gun on herself instead of shooting Hercule because she thinks she's responsible. And because of this act, Hercule has to go back and decide, okay, now what do I do? He decides to lie to the police and let all the people go so they can heal. Now, magically, because this guy is dead, people that were addicted to drugs, people that were depressed, people that were miserable, all of a sudden healed because this one guy has been killed. Um, I argue that would not happen, but obviously this killer deserved to die for what he did. But when you get to the point where you say, if I'm hurt enough, if I'm offended enough, if, even though he didn't attack me necessarily, if I'm just affected enough, then I have the right to kill this person, that is a dangerous slope to go on. Think about the debate we're having right now with free speech. If enough people are hurt by your speech, then all of a sudden you lose your right to. Not because the law says so, but because enough people's opinions sway it. The law bends to subjective reasoning and subjective morality. And if that ball continues to roll, you lose your inarguable rights because now the argument is not the law that is inarguable. Now, we are all subject to the mercies of the mob's opinion. And that can be a dangerous place to end up. I'm Ben Davies with The Real Rebel Review. <laughs> all right, if you like this video and others like it, please consider becoming a premium member to The Rebel. That way you'll have first access to Pure Hollywood and the entire Rebel lineup.